Good evening. Uh, my name is Sean Dixon, and I'm the Coastal Policy Attorney at Clean Ocean Action. So today we're going to be talking about Port Ambrose LNG, which is a proposed liquefied natural gas facility for offshore of Long Island. What is LNG? LNG stands for liquefied natural gas, and it's through a process of cooling natural gas, the natural gas you see coming out of your stove. It can bring natural gas to a liquid state, which is one six hundredth the volume of its gaseous state. As a liquid, uh, cooled to negative 260 degrees, LNG can be loaded into vessels like this one, which is the size of the Empire State Building, and shipped around the world. So when this technology was developed to super cool natural gas, it really opened up the door to a global market in natural gas imports and exports. It's necessary, however, to really be particular about what the definition of LNG is. LNG can be used for things like buses. So you're going to hear a lot, uh, especially in the upcoming years, about New York City, New York State, and a lot of other places in Texas and, and giant trucking routes. They're all converting engines over to using natural gas with LNG tanks on board their buses or their long haul trucks. You can also use LNG in terms of storage. So you can have storage um, liquefied natural gas silos, if you will, uh, scattered around our coastlines. There's some in New Jersey. There used to be some in New York until there was an explosion in Staten Island and then there were no new ones. And so I think believe that's under consideration right now. But LNG as storage. The LNG that we're going to be talking about today is for a port for the import or export of LNG on these vessels. To quite clearly add just one other distinction, this port offshore that's proposed for just south of Jones Beach, New York, is an offshore import-export facility. So there's no production involved. Thankfully, we fought really, really hard to knock oil and gas production out of the Mid-Atlantic Ocean and keep it off of our shores. So this is really just for now, the battle is over this import facility, opening up Marcellus shale gas for, for imports and exports, and opening up our, uh, our, our region to the vulnerability of too much reliance on more natural gas infrastructure. So what we're talking about today is the picture on the left here, which is Port Ambrose facility. Port Ambrose is uh, just to backtrack a little bit because a lot of people are more familiar with things like BP and Shell and, and ExxonMobil. Port Ambrose at the bottom is, is a, a port application shell company that's owned by Liberty Natural Gas, Liberty LNG. Liberty LNG is in turn owned by Westface Capital, which is a investment manager in Toronto, Canada that is owned by a Cayman Island bank account that we're not allowed to find any details for. So that's who they are. They're not ExxonMobil, they're not open to shareholders, they're owned by a Cayman Island bank account. Port Ambrose, uh, Liberty LNG, uh, to be very specific about where it is, because it helps people get a frame of reference geographically, would, uh, starting near shore, uh, the, the land at the top of this map is the south shore of Long Island. The red line, uh, to the top left intersects with an existing offshore natural gas pipeline called the Transco Williams Natural Gas Pipeline. That pipeline runs from New Jersey to uh, Long Beach, New York. Port Ambrose and Liberty Natural Gas are proposing to build a, a pipeline, a new pipeline, to intersect with Transco about two miles off of Atlantic Beach and go 22 miles out into the ocean where they're going to build two buoys as their port where ships the size of the Empire State Building can come in and can go uh, either bringing in LNG or exporting it to foreign markets. So that's what we're looking at here, a 22 mile uh, pipeline and two buoys at the end of it. Just to be entirely clear, this is not a new source of natural gas to the region. It's not, to, to, to use a metaphor, it's not like we're bring, that Liberty Natural Gas wants to bring in a new grocery store or a supermarket. They're just a new supplier to an existing pipeline. The problem here, as we'll see a little bit later, is they're trying to sell us on natural gas that's liquefied and costs three to four times more money than the gas that's already in that pipeline. So it doesn't make it economic sense, but it's a new supplier, not a new source. So it's not diversifying New York City or Long Island, because again, this goes to Long Beach and then out east on Long Island. It's a new supplier. So there's a lot of conflicts that we see with Liberty Natural Gas's application. Uh, two of the most... Uh, on your face conflicts are inter interference with shipping lanes and vessel traffic and with the proposed offshore wind farm that we're going to hear about a little bit later. LNG, uh, Liberty Natural Gas, is proposing to build Port Ambrose in between two of the three shipping lanes that go into and out of the Port of New York, right in the same spot on this map with the red no sign. 
Um, that was intentional. Uh, right on the same spot of the highest waves recorded in this region during Superstorm Sandy. That pipeline would traverse uh, these, one of the shipping lanes, closing it off for almost nine months while they lay the cable. And it would be right at the first third of the off offshore wind proposed area, which led the federal government, one of the agencies that handles approving offshore wind, to say that the existence of Port Ambrose could jeopardize the entire feasibility of having any offshore wind off of New York State. So what they, desi they, they intend to do is bring LNG ships in through the shipping lanes and cut over to their port. Um, the danger here that Chris Christie, the, the governor of New Jersey, recognized a, a while ago was that if anything happens, if there's any problems out there, like we saw in Sandy, that cuts off supplies or the ability of ships to go in and out of the port of New York, you're jeopardizing the 300,000 people that work at the port, and you're jeopardizing the ability to bring in gasoline to the region, food, supplies, all of that that, needs to, that relies on these, these shipping lanes is going to be put in jeopardy. Um, the blue on here shows the intensity of vessel traffic, and so it's, it's really surrounded by the, the approaches, some of the most used approaches, especially over the pipeline, of the busiest port on the eastern seaboard. This is a little bit more detail, and, and I want to showcase how this is in the middle of wind, and we, it's not ever been made really clear by the applicant. This is from uh, Liberty Natural Gas's application, and so what they show here is the port and where the pipelines go. What they don't show you is that that's the wind energy area that's proposed for offshore. So it's, it's really right in the middle of what's been uh, proposed to be a renewable energy source, which is this stark contrast. We're looking at whether you want to bring in renewables and green and jobs that require maintenance, or you want to bring in uh, a, a natural gas port that, according to the application, is going to bring six to ten permanent jobs to the region. And that's it. So uh, just to walk through some of the, the issues and impacts that this port uh, leads to. First, more fossil fuel reliance. What happened in New England uh, years and years ago is New England said, listen, we're growing, there's a lot of people, we're worried about uh, too much overloaded capacity on our energy markets. So they built LNG, an LNG tank, uh, or an LNG import facility off of Boston, and then two more which have only been used twice and shut down. Um, but they built that, and they, they built their energy infrastructure around natural gas. And now, 10 years later, 20 years later, they're tied to natural gas. They didn't invest in smart technology. They didn't invest in renewables or conservation and efficiency. And so increasing that fossil fuel reliance is not the game plan of the future. It's something that we had to do in the 70s and 80s. It's not something we want to do now with everything that we know. Uh, it also results in fisheries exclusions. I mentioned that there's two ports of the almost exact same design off of Boston. They haven't been used. One was at, just asked to shut down, but it's still there. Another one hasn't been used since the first shipment ever, it ever got. Both of those facilities around the buoy, there's a two-mile-long exclusion zone. And then the whole pipeline where fishermen can't drag their nets, where they can't go near them, so there are these giant blocks of the ocean that fishermen can't use. Spills. One of the biggest problems that we're looking at here, especially because Liberty says, don't worry about the wind, we can build within that. Well, these ships are carrying massive amounts of diesel fuel and marine oils because they're ships the size of the Empire State Building. Uh, if a spill happens in the middle of a wind farm, unlike the Gulf, where there's massive amounts of open ocean where you can put a boom around the oil and control the spill and try to clean it up, preventing what's already been done in terms of environmental damage, when it's within a wind farm, you can't really do that because you're going in and out of wind turbines. So they haven't ever had to come with, up with this problem in the United States before because there are no massive uh, offshore wind facilities. So this is a new problem that Liberty Natural Gas is trying to make everybody ignore so they can get their license and they can build it first. Uh, there's hurricane problems. I don't need to tell people in this room about Sandy that hit right where Port Ambrose is proposed for. Uh, first responders problems. These LNG facilities are terror targets. Al-Qaeda just attacked one in Yemen about four months ago. Uh, all of the burden on the first responders, which is something that uh, is confidential, so we're not allowed to review that, but the governor of New Jersey and the state of New York have reviewed that, and they determined, well, the governor of New Jersey specifically determined that it would be too much of an added reliance on the first responders of the state of New Jersey uh, to justify existence. Um, water and noise pollution, it's gonna, they're going to be using millions of gallons of biocides to test their pipelines and repair their pipelines. Noise pollution, driving in giant anchors into the seafloor. Uh, my, my favorite impact was there's a fault line that runs right underneath the proposed pipeline. And Liberty Natural Gas in their application says, don't worry, there haven't been any earthquakes in five years, so it's not a problem. 
So they didn't even have to look into that. So we said that's, you know, we cried foul. Um, upstream impacts. If you're relying on oil and gas, especially if you want to export this oil and gas, you're going to be leading to a lot more fracking and a lot more production uh, in the shale gas basins that is not wise for the future either. There's the, G the greenhouse gas additive impacts, LNG, because you have to liquefy it and transport it, can be up to 40% more climate impactive than normal natural gas, so it's not even a good alternative. And like I said, six to 10 permanent jobs. Uh, quickly, uh, as we all know, the shale gas revolution hit, and we're expecting the United States on a trajectory of, of natural gas utilization in the way the Department of Energy is pushing our country to have, um, uh, to be a net LNG exporter by 2016. That's two years from now, a net LNG exporter. We're expected to be a net natural gas exporter through LNG and pipelines by 2020. That's four years from now. So they're looking to take all this extra gas, the increasing amount of gas there from shale, and send it overseas. This is, as you have probably heard in the news, they're doing the same thing with crude oil. They're trying to say now that we should export our crude oil. And two years ago, we became a net exporter of petroleum products, like motor oils and diesel. So we're sending our natural gas overseas. All of the impacts are here at home. None of the jobs are going to help us. And as we've seen over the last three years, the number of proposed LNG export facilities around the country have gone from zero to 20. One is currently under operation, it should be done soon. A whole slew of others are on the docket. Um, and the United States, under the Natural Gas Act, which says that if you want to export to a free trade nation, if you want to send natural gas to a nation with which we have a free trade agreement, your application must be approved without modification or delay for a $50 application fee. So there's 20 countries around the world with which we have this ability, if you're an energy company, to say, I've got $50 and I want to send it there to South Korea or I want to send it there to Panama. And you have to get that approved. There's no review whatsoever. And so what we're, we're worried about, especially after the State of the Union, is that the Trans-Pacific Partnership and the trade agreements with the European Union all have natural gas free trade provisions in there. So we're looking at walking into a situation where all of the Pacific countries that are part of that, from South America to Asia, and all of Europe, which is clamoring to get American natural gas, are going to be able to, to have it drawn out of the United States for no review and $50. Speaking of Port Ambrose and Europe, what we found was West Face Capital, that Cayman Island bank account that owns this port, they only own one other thing, and that's an LNG import facility in the UK that's the exact same size, design, shape, uh, as Port Ambrose, has the exact same contractor for shipping all of the LNG and is actually managed by the same person who is Port Ambrose's CEO. Their websites are a mirror image of each other. Port Ambrose is blue, Port Meridian is red. So it's a really uh, stark picture that, that we have before us here where Port Ambrose is being built right next to Marcellus Shale. We're already seeing it in Maryland where Dominion Cove Point wants to draw shale gas for export overseas. They already have their applications in, by the way, and approvals to do that from the Department of Energy. Yet uh, Port Ambrose is even closer, and they own a facility on their other side of the pond. So what are the states and localities saying about this? New Jersey vetoed, the governor of New Jersey vetoed this port in 2011. Uh, they changed their location to what we have before you today, and they resubmitted uh, their application. And he reaffirmed that veto in 2012. So this, we've seen this before. We fought Liberty Natural Gas before. Um, and yet they're still coming back. Because every, even if they go away, even if they withdraw their application, they can always submit another one again, even if it's already been said no to. In New York State, all of the energy plans that we're seeing, including the, energy, the draft energy plan that just came out in January, um, on the 7th, I believe, said that not only are LNG imports not needed, we're very concerned about LNG exports. It's going to lead to price fluctuations and drastically affect our market, our ability as a city to buy natural gas and to afford that. So New York State's draft energy plan says beware of LNG exports and imports are a thing of the past, nobody's doing it. Because if, if Liberty Natural Gas wants to be a new supplier, if they want to be for your grocery store, that new supplier of lettuce or of hummus or whatever they're bringing in, you got to remember this, they're bringing in on a ship instead of a pipeline, and that adds almost two to three times to the cost of bringing it here. So they're, they're trying to tell the people in New York that instead of buying from somebody for $3, buy from me for 10 And that doesn't make any economic sense whatsoever, unless you look at it by exports. Because in Europe, the price of natural gas right now is 10 and it's $3 here. And so if Liberty can work with people 
in the United States to bring Marcellus Shell gas to their boats and send it to the UK, they can make that profit. The other way around doesn't make any economic sense. And in New York City, during the review of this port, uh, Mayor Bloomberg's office said, we'd prefer wind, and there's no LNG need in the city of New York. So as you can see, New Jersey, New York, New York City, everybody is saying no to this project, yet they're still around. So what can you do about it? Uh, there is, we are in the middle of the application review. Unlike any other project you've ever heard of, uh, this has to be done within about a year. So we're looking at two to three more months of, of activity around this. So you're going to see final licensing hearings. You're going to see this issue come to a conclusion before summertime unless we can get it to be said no, like tomorrow morning, which is my hope, but you know. Um, governor vetoes. This law, unlike any other in the federal government, gives states the ability to veto uh, a port pro proposal like this. So we're working on trying to ask Governor Christie to veto this again and trying to ask Governor Cuomo to step in and veto this project because they have the authority to just say no, no questions asked, it goes away. Um, also, local municipal opposition. We've been working for years at Clean Ocean Action to build a network of towns along the shore opposed to not only LNG, but any offshore oil and gas development, any of these ocean industrialization activities. And we've had great success all over the coastline from Cape May to Montauk in making sure that there is a wall of townships and cities and supervisors and mayors that say, no, this is not a good idea. We want our beaches clean. And finally, you can join our Clean Ocean Action Coalition. Uh, Cindy Ziff, our executive director, is here today. And there's lots of information in the back, and I'm here for questions. Uh, thank you very much.